Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. Today, we are broadcasting in partnership with the Alliance for Global Justice, Chicago Alba Solidarity, Friends of Latin America, Friends of the ATC, Task Force on the Americas. We will be in conversation today with Paul Oquist, Minister, Private Secretary of National Policy in the Presidency of the Republic. And Paul is joining us today from Managua, Nicaragua, and we're so honored to have him with us. We're going to be talking today about Hurricane Eta and its uh, effects on the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, and also how, it's how the hurricane's uh, strength was related to climate change and the policies that the Nicaragua government has in place regarding both hurricane response and its adaptation uh, to climate change. So that will be our conversation today. Welcome for joining us, Paul. It's so, I'm so pleased to have you back on our program and I'm thankful for you accepting our invitation. Thank you for the kind invitation. I'm very pleased also. Well, we're pleased to have you back. So let's start our conversation today with um, last week's hurricane that was profoundly uh, devastating to the Atlantic coast of several Central American countries, including Nicaragua. It's a story that unfortunately did not uh, make much splash in the US news due to the coverage mm -hmm. of the presidential elections in the United States. But let's talk about the hurricane and where it hit and, and what the people, how the people responded and how the government responded. Well, thank you very much for saying last week's hurricane, because this is, uh, make, make, allows me to underscore this hurricane uh, season, because we have last week's hurricane entering in the northeast of Nicaragua, the, uh, the North Caribbean Autonomous Region. And um, I mentioned last week's hurricane because next week's hurricane is scheduled to hit on Monday at 7 a.m. It's now a tropical depression off the coast of Colombia, but it will strengthen going across. It's a tropical depression number 31, and it is going to hit in the very same area as last week's hurricane. So it's going to be a one-two punch from the, from the hurricane season. And, uh, you know, this hurricane season was 29 hurricanes have been named to date. Last, the last time they had a, a, such an amount was in 2005, it was 28. So this is the record hurricane season. And the hurricane hit uh, just south of uh, Bilwi, also known as Puerto Cavazas, the poorest area of Nicaragua. And uh, the damage was centered on social infrastructure. 1,890 houses were destroyed. 8,030 houses were partial, partially damaged. 16 health centers were damaged. Uh, the New Dawn Regional Hospital, which is a very new hospital, was damaged also. 45 educational centers, the drinking water, water treatment plant, 66 bridges, uh, public buildings, stadiums, sports centers, parks, and um, 49,000 houses suffered electric uh, power interruptions. And on the production side, there was uh, two processing plants where they damaged 10 seafood collection centers, 12 boats and 38 pangas, which are the artisan uh, small boats, the pangas were damaged. And it affected 39% of the total of the national system of protected areas when it moved into the Bosa Watts uh, Reserve biosphere. So there, there was damage to the, to the forest. The preliminary quantification of damages is $172 million. The need for replacement and immediate restoration amounts to uh, 364 million dollars. And among the highlights with regard to the immediate needs, there is a situation of food insecurity. There's a need for 2.9 million dollars to supplement the food that has already been sent. 
which is truckloads of food from uh, Managua, 14.7 million for the most urgent housing replacements, and uh, 6.1 million for the educational sector, 4.2 million for the health sector to rehabilitate, rehabilitate the health unit. Of course, this is all happening right in the pandemic too. Exactly. So you know, we have all of the all of the scourges of the apocalypse hitting us here, the storm, the pandemic, the, the economic depression. This is a region that lives basically off of the uh, fishing and the seafood sector, as you can, attend, as you can mention. There are 6.4 million needed to repair bridges and uh, roads in the municipal dock. For water and energy, $893,000 needs uh, to reestablish the primary and secondary energy supply. You know, the preparation for this was excellent. There was uh, evacuations were timely. Uh, there was a total of uh, 71,145 people were evacuated. 47,297 were kept in 325 uh, emergency centers and no human lives were lost. Wow. This contrasts enormously to Hurricane Felix, a Category 5 hurricane that struck the same region in 2007. In 2007, this government didn't have its act put together yet. We had just arrived into power the 10th of January of 2007. And there was 101 people died in that, uh, in that hurricane. Now, 20 years later, we have Sinapred, which is our emergency service, uh, emergency civil defense system, which is well integrated with the climate change uh, effort as well. It's all integrated. And there is lots of training and even uh, uh, exercises undertaken. So people have been through several exercises of what to do in a hurricane and even, you know, mock, uh, medical attention, mock evacuations. And so people were ready. And people were evacuated, especially from the highly vulnerable Mosquito Keys, which are some low lying waters off the coast where people build on sticks, on the poles, these very precarious uh, houses, which are just temporary while they're out there catching a lobster. It's a very rich area in lobster. So in Felix, people left that area too late trying to get to the mainland and many of them were killed trying to do that. This time everyone was evacuated uh, promptly with a good uh, a lead time. And almost 2 million people were exposed to this hurricane, uh, mostly in the Northern Caribbean coast autonomous region, in the mining area, in Nueva Segovia, Hinontega, and Chinandega that also got a lot of heavy rainfall. Then as you know, it went into Honduras and Guatemala. In Guatemala, there was a lot of people killed. Over 100 people were killed in Guatemala. I guess 120 something were killed in Guatemala. And um, then it went through Yucatan, out back into Cuba, took a little spin around and then came up into the Gulf and made landfall in Florida, crossed Florida and was now moving up the East Coast. This new tropical depression uh, 31 is scheduled to make landfall at 7 a.m. on Monday, right at the border between Honduras and Nicaragua, which is the Coco River, you know, in the Mesquito language as the as the Wonky, the Wonky River. You know, um, the uh, hurricane season we have uh, Eta up on the East Coast. We have set up further out in the Atlantic. We have this tropical depression 31. There's some people here already calling uh, Hurricane Iota, thinking that it's going to uh, strengthen to be a hurricane before it reaches. This Eta was also a tropical storm and it strengthened very rapidly to a category four, almost at the limit of category five in a very short period of time before it uh, made landfall in, uh, in Nicaragua. So 
The news is that the storm was strong, the damage is significant, but that the civil defense systems in Nicaragua are now in place, people are trained, evacuations uh, have been practiced and were executed smoothly, and this saved lives. This saved lives. And now uh, the government is sending uh, supplies to meet the emergency uh, situation. There were even 2,000 people evacuated on the Cocoa River thinking there could be uh, flooding, but um, it turned out that didn't happen, but no, no, uh, no problem. They were sheltered in case it well might happen. And um, the government is sending 17,200 sheets of zinc, which is the housing in that area for uh, re-getting shelter. And it sent uh, four trailers with 88 tons of food to Bilby, the main city of the other region for immediate assistance. And four trucks loaded with uh, first response items such as mattresses, plastic, hygiene kits, and more were unloaded in Suna and Bilby. Suna is in the, in the mining region. And with the support of members of the Nicaraguan Naval Force, dozens of families who were engaged in fishing in the Mosquito Keys were evacuated and the local fishing fleet was used also for that evacuation from the Mesquito Key area, which made all the difference between Hurricane Felix in 2007 and Edna in, uh, in 2020. And you know, the best civil defense system in the world is Cuba's. You get yes. a hurricane come through the, the, uh, the islands and you have 100 people dead here, 200 people dead there, 50 people dead at other places. And it goes through Cuba, and if there's one death, there's a national scandal. What happened? Why wasn't that person evacuated? What was the, uh, si the situation that this tree fell on this person being in an area that was that dangerous? Because uh, they not only have that, but their uh, adaptation is incredible, and it's something that we're trying to replicate here, and that is that their reservoirs are overdimensioned. They make the reservoir oh. with a lot more capacity so that when a hurricane comes along, you can get two or three years of water from the hurricane in these reservoirs that fill up to capacity. You stop the flooding. Yeah. Or manage exactly. flooding as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So and use it flooding. as a catchment system. And you have this catchment and you have this water supply. We have wow. a lot of work being done in the, in, in the and when you talk about adaptation in the dry zone. We have been working with uh, over 5,000 small water harvesting works have been built, such as reservoirs, 5,323 to be exact, lagoons, micro dams, and rainwater collection systems on the roofs of houses, prioritizing the communities in the dry zone, this corredor seco that mm -hmm. goes from Nicaragua to Honduras to Guatemala and ends in southern, uh, in southern Mexico. And, and Paul, is that cor that corridor cycle is that growing? Is that expanding due to climate change? Yes, or, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. It's becoming more and more arid. It's becoming more and more arid, and it's one of the biggest problems in Central America. And it's something that's not on the U.S. radar yet, but sooner or later it will be, because if the campesino subsistence economy in Central America collapses, is in, Mes in Mesoamerica collapses, because this is includes Southern Mexico. Exactly, this, yes. Uh, this zone, you know, the Oaxaca, Chiapas, uh, Yucatan, very indigenous, high indigenous population areas. Then Guatemala, high indigenous population. Then Honduras, Nicaragua, Nicaragua with the indigenous population primarily on the on the Caribbean coast. If this campesino subsistence economy collapses, you'll have 18 million people walking towards the, the major cities of the region or marching north to climb over, dig under, or blast through any wall they might find on the way. I want, I'd like to, um, <laughs> Well, so we can see, and this again, I think, you know, this is something we should talk about on yet another conversation with you is 
you know, how climate change is, is, <coughs> one of the, if, is one, if not the largest root causes of migration that is not recognized in the United States. But while we're talking about adaptation, Nicaragua's uh, capability to recognize climate change and adapt to it, I had the good fortune of being on, um, on a delegation in August of 2014. I went with one of our partners today, um, Alliance for Global Justice, and we went to study uh, renewable energy and um, how the Nicaraguan government, the current government was adapting and responding to climate change. And it was so wonderful for me personally to be on that trip talking to people who completely recognized as a government and as a society climate change. Whereas in the United States, we still have this conversation you know, as to whether or not climate change is real. But it was profound, the, you know, the projects and the programs that the government has in place to adapt to climate change and also the enormous renewable energy projects that you have. I think in August of 14, it was 52% renewables and, and it's 77 plus percent at this point. That's right. It started out in 2007 at uh, 26% rounding it off. And then it um, is now 77% and it's going, <coughs> It's going to be 90% by 2023. And we'll leave some back up with gas. But <laughs> we also have a very nice mix. Of hydroelectric, geothermal, wind, solar, biomass. We have a canasta with everything in it. <laughs> and so, and you have that, and as you just said, you have um, try, following the example of the Cubans having these oversized reservoirs for to control floodwaters and to gather water in dry zones we're, and the catchment system. In, we're working on that, especially in the uh, in the dry zone, in the dry zone. Mm -hmm. In the, in the Caribbean coast, you know, there's no water problem. There is abundant rainfall. As a matter of fact, south of Bluefields to the, uh, the Costa Rican border is one of the rainiest areas in the world. They get uh, 5,000 milliliters of uh, agua of water a year. That's five meters of rainfall. That's a lot of rainfall. Wow. On, on top of years. hurricane rain. So they're yeah. very vulnerable. Well, the hurricanes have tended to go a bit further north, but oh. uh, they're completely unpredictable these days. They can go anywhere. And how are those Atlantic communities dealing with, and the islands, you mentioned some of the smaller islands, how are they, how are they and the government managing rising sea level? Well, in um, Corn Island and Little Corn Island, which are inhabited areas, we are doing some water protection systems for their water supply. Because you know, in the South Pacific, the islands don't die when they're completely underwater. All you need is for the seawater to penetrate their aquifers and the islands dead, but they no longer have uh, fresh water. So that's what's being done on uh, Corn Island and Little Corn Island, which are populated. The Mosquito Keys are already underwater. The houses are on, on stilts because it's a very low lying area. And the people don't reside there permanently. They go out there to uh, fish for lobster and they go back to Puerto Cabezas or Prince of Polka or wherever they live. Wow, it's really, I mean, it's fascinating and encouraging. I mean, it's all, and it's devastating too, all in, in one, you know, thought how what's happening uh, in, regarding climate change, the, the, the increasing number of storms and the increasing magnitude of the storms, rising sea level, which we simply do not talk about in the United States, particularly as to how rising sea level is affecting um, our immediate neighbors and specifically those living uh, on Caribbean island states. And even in the Keys of Florida,
We unmuted you. Stop, stop. We can't hear you. Unmute yourself. Can you yeah, hear me okay. now? <laughs> yes. Sorry. Every Thank time you. they have a very high tide in Miami Beach, they get water. Yes. Hello? Yeah. And, um, you know. We don't talk about that in the States, though, do we? About there's Florida. A map, there's a map that the National Geographic has that is of the world with a five meter increase in, uh, in sea level. Now a five meter increase in sea level is perhaps some centuries away. But when you do the half a meter of the meter, it's hard to see the real impact. But with this five meter, even though it's far off, you see where the vulnerable areas are. And Florida ceases to exist. It becomes uh, completely underwater. The Mississippi goes all the way up to maybe St. Louis as a big lake, very broad lake. That whole basin goes up. And in, uh, and in Europe, of course, you know that Venice is going to go under in that region, but also it's the Netherlands, of course, the lowlands, the Netherlands, uh, the, uh, the, the low countries, and, uh, and Denmark also, and Northern Germany. So you get uh, really huge impacts. And these are the areas that we have to watch even now as the sea level does rise, as uh, global warming continues and the ice in Antarctica and in Greenland and in, and in the Arctic becomes scarcer and scarcer as it melts with, uh, with global warming. You know, I hope that this uh, COP26 in Glasgow turns out to have a different storyline than uh, COP25 in Madrid, which failed, as you know. And yes. uh, with the US coming back in the Paris Agreement, it would be interesting to see what implications that might have for moving forward, because it's nice to have the US back, but what we need is real action on ambition and more real action on finance for the developing countries due to climate change. So more, so you, we, you just mentioned the, the Paris Accord. So this is, this is talk that we're hearing, reading in the U.S. media that um, assuming Joe Biden is the next president of the United States, that he is talking about um, re, having the U.S. rejoin the Paris Accord. But now this is an accord that, and yes, we would hope that the United States elevate the discussion on climate change and help push for financing for uh, vulnerable countries to change, make the necessary changes and adaptations. But Nicaragua also is, it has its opinion on these accords that they don't go strong, they're not strong enough. Well, they're not. The U.S. says they're too strong in Nicaragua. Of course, Nicaragua is a very vulnerable country uh, relative to storms Secretary, and rising Secretary Sarah. General Antonio Guterres of the United Nations called the Madrid COP25 summit, the ambition summit, because he hoped that the countries would raise their level of ambition of greenhouse gas reduction to the point that the objectives of the Paris Agreement could be met. Because as it stands, you're not going to get to uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade with the commitments the countries have made, or even two degrees centigrade. It will go up to something like 3.7 or four degrees centigrade. And that is, a, that is a worldwide average. So that worldwide average would come out in the tropics and in the desert and in the Arctic areas, somewhere between four and six degrees, which is catastrophic. So we really need to get into serious ambition if we're going to achieve the necessary goals, which were spelled out by the International Panel on Climate Change, the scientific panel study of October 2018 that pointed out to be able to keep the lid on climate change and maintain a global warming of 1.5 degrees world average in this century, we need to reduce emissions by 45 percent by 2030 and achieve a global net zero emission society by 2050. So the- uh, We don't have much time. 
No, we don't. We don't at all. And the uh, and the objectors are ambitious. They are feasible. This can be done, but you need real serious uh, policy decisions. So, Paul, what can we do uh, in the United States? What can what can we as voters as citizens what do we need to do you know as you representing a voice of a country that's particularly vulnerable what what can we do to influence our government to recognize climate change and effectively act on it well the thing would be you know there was at the vote 25 and before there were people from the united states showing up that um had a movement called We're Still In, which included California, Colorado, Oregon, Washington. And there was an entire series of cities which were making the commitment. And these are important cities. It was the most important yeah. cities in the United States. Uh, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and in between. They were saying they were going to meet the commitments required by the, uh, by the Paris Agreement. So there's something to build on there in terms of, uh, of getting into uh, the thing. But I think that the, the political restrictions on this were evidence in the campaign on the issue of the oil and gas industry and fracking that uh, politically was an explosive topic. So I think that the, the consciousness that the, the green economy is not a great depression but the green economy is just another way to organize the economy and to uh, achieve even greater prosperity in the, in the long run is a, is a big political battle in the United States because it, you can see that it was anathema to many politicians to talk about uh, serious action with regard to oil or gas or, or fracking. Maybe we ought to start by organizing the people in Florida, particularly in the Keys. <laughs> they yeah. Can they can overtly, they're overtly experiencing rising sea level and they may be a really good place for us to start as far but, as personal living conditions. But you know, you, you, you asked about the, what can be done to improve the situation here. Well, the situation in Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua is that the unilateral coercive measures that are illegal really restrict the capacity of the societies to react to climate change, to react to the Great Depression, and even to react to the, the pandemic of uh, COVID-19. And according to uh, Article 7 and uh, numeral 1, literal K of the Statute of Paris, that constitutes elevating the illegality of the coercive measures to the level of a crime against humanity. If you are affecting the preventive health capacity and the health service capacity of a society during a pandemic, that is a crime against uh, humanity. And these things are really ridiculous. I think they, they, they should be struck down in, uh, in a court of law in the United States. And perhaps there's some lawyers who could get together and work on this because you know, it's, um, they say that they're defending human rights, but these measures violate all the human rights in the world. Exactly, yeah. Huh? There's no right. human rights at all with regard well, and to- it's, And in those countries that are trying so desperately to battle COVID-19 and can't ha don't have access to international medical supplies and relief, it's basically a form of genocide against them, the populations. It's- You know, it's, Secretary it's, General- it's Catastrophe. Gutierrez, uh, had proposed lifting the measures during the during the pandemic, and they paid no attention uh, paid no attention to him. But you know, these measures are heavy stuff because if you look at what the mentality behind them is, it's that the United States government and the European Union government and the UK and Canada, and I don't know why Switzerland wanted to join that club, but they did recently think that they're morally superior to everyone else in the world. And this moral superiority allows them then to self-appoint themselves as vigilantes 
to uh, police corruption and human rights in the rest of the of the world. And this means that the rest of the world should fall in line with their mandates, might fall in line with their impositions. This well, that's is particularly the true uh, in the, in the global mentality. South. This is the imperialist, colonialist, yeah. neo-colonial mentality of wanting to run the rest of the countries in the, in the world according to their wishes. And uh, so this is the battle against neo-colonial mentality in the 21st century are these types of uh, these types of measures. You know, there's one measure in one of the ordinances on Nicaragua and one of the decrees that states that anyone who's been in the government since 2007 is subject to these, uh, these illegal uh, coercive measures. I don't like to use the word sanctions because the only yeah. sanctions that are legal are those of the Security Council of the United Nations. These are illegal, coercive, unilateral measures. And uh, so this means that the U.S., by saying that anyone who is in the government uh, can be subject to this, is, uh, is not recognizing the 2016 election in which um, uh, President Ortega was reelected with 72% of the vote congruent with all the polls that were taken at that time by all the political sectors. So it's, it's violating the right to free speech. It's violating the right to, um, uh, to political participation, to, to choose the political party of your choice, the right to serve in a government, the right to have represent, representatives in a, in a government. So the violation of rights is just uh, across the board. But there's a, a last point I want to make on this, and that is that, um, you know, these, these things are completely administrative actions with no judicial recourse. And they last forever in the United States. Correct. And they create a uh, cast of people who are uh, civilly dead. They can have no transactions of any kind. And uh, so it's like a cast, a cast of un economic untouchables. And I think I would like to see a group of lawyers in the United States get together and take this to task for violating the freedom of speech, freedom of political choice, and cruel and unusual punishment. The U.S. Constitution prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. And making this cast of economic untouchables is cruel and unusual punishment. Punishing an entire society politically is cruel and unusual punishment. You know, when the Germans would uh, uh, do extrajudicial killings of people in the village because a German soldier had been killed, this is the equivalent of that in terms of an entire society being deprived of its economic wherewithal, of medicines, and, and we're talking about Venezuela now, but also to a certain extent, Nicaragua and Cuba, of, uh, of its economic capacity being punished for political reasons by a foreign power. That is cruel and unusual punishment also. Well, you use the term unilateral coercive measures and unilateral being, from a legal perspective, unilateral being the key word that, you know, these are sanctions as they're commonly called in the United States, uh, economic warfare, hybrid warfare, but unilaterally designated by the United States, not by the UN National Security Council by majority vote within that council. It's, um, that's I do where want- That's where it resides is illegality. The only exactly. things that are legal are from the Security Council. Yeah. And so one thing I do want to share with you and, and our viewers is that Code Pink and many other um, activist groups um, in the United States have representatives in Washington, D.C., and we have several um, coalitions that, uh, that lobby regularly in Washington, D.C. to lift sanctions for the longest time, North Korea and Cuba, but that does now include Venezuela, Nicaragua, <laughs> Iran, and on and on and on. I believe the list of countries is about 39 countries, 33 Exactly, 39 countries with 2 billion people in population have been affected by the uh, illegal coercive measures. 
was the it's United about, States, European Union, UK, and a little one lesser extent Canada. So that number is about 33% of the world's population. I mean, That's to, right. just to get our viewers to understand how many people are suffering. And, and they're and put, making that number of people on the planet vulnerable only makes the population of the United States more vulnerable, particularly to disease, this, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic specifically. So, you know, Paul, I'm looking at the time and I know I promised you only 30 minutes and I'm always so happy when you can spend more time with us. Is there any, is there anything else we should talk about before I let you go? Is there anything we did yes. not highlight today? Yes. Given the fact that the world is facing simultaneously the corona, the new coronavirus and the COVID-19 pandemic, the Great uh, Depression 2020, largely derived from the great lockdowns. And this has generated accelerating extreme inequality. And in addition to that, we're seeing the initiation of a second Cold War. The situation for the developing countries becomes very desperate. That is a complete overload of external shocks for the developing countries. And therefore, I think that it would be reasonable in the interest of everyone <coughs> to condone debt for the period 2020-2024. Hmm. <clears throat> because it's better to have uh, a debt holiday for these four years as part of the solution than to have country after country default on its debt as part of the problem. Hmm. And these the successive line of defaults will undermine the economic recovery also. So I think it behooves the entire world to seriously consider the debt issue with regard to developing countries. You know, look at how many trillions of dollars are being thrown at the problem in the developed countries, the United States, Europe, the other developed countries. So, how are the developing countries going to uh, deal with this when their uh, resource base is shrinking because of the depression? They have less resources and they have to pay the debt on top of it. It's not sustainable, really. It's not sustainable. I think, you know, in historic terms, we used to call debt forgiveness on that scale a jubilee, correct? Is that a debt jubilee? Or, and it is pretty, I'm sitting here in Mexico City since September and been living here and just watching, um, you know, there are no tourists here right now. And you can just see just that alone, that one industry's effect on the overall economy of, of Mexico. And Mexico has a fairly strong economy. It's very precarious. You walk down the street and there's so many vendors who are used to selling to tourists and there are no tourists here. And you just, for me personally, I want to buy something from everyone every day. And that is not financially sustainable on my part, but it's very, very precarious. And I'm, it's really important that you brought this up. The default of so many developing countries is going to create a major problem for the entire world. But I think you could also argue that that is in horrifying terms, a desired effect for neoliberal governments, neoliberal capitalists to come in and grab resources, infrastructure, natural resources, and that, what, what, what do we call that? Naomi Klein calls that disaster capitalism, correct? Well, you know, I was really struck by Antigua Barbuda. You know, the island of Barbuda was back flat, as were Dominica, uh, uh, the Grand Bahama, and Abacoa Islands in the Bahamas also. And um, I know people from there. And you had people uh, in some of the developed countries saying, oh, why do these people want to live on those little islands so prone to hurricanes? 
And then the Prime Minister of Dominica, Skirit uh, Roosevelt, Roosevelt Skirit, he came out and said, oh, we're not going to give up uh, 350 years of, of history, 350 years of community, 350 years of our forging a nation here uh, just because of the weather. And uh, at the same time as he was saying that, developers were moving into Barbuda, offering money to the people who are flat broke, have lost everything, trying to buy up the entire island for uh, a tourist development. So there you have your uh, disaster capitalism. Well, we could, gosh, that's a whole nother theme for us to talk about. I have a list of three, three, maybe five things I would love to have you come back and talk about as individual um, topics. One thing, Paul, I want to share with you and our viewers before I let you go is that um, Code Pink in conjunction with um, the Sanctions Kill Coalition, which is at sanctionskill.org, we are developing uh, a delegation for late January, early February 2021 to come to Nicaragua and study renewable energy, study climate change adaptation, and to study the effects of uni uh, unilateral coercive measures on the country, its people, and its government. So we will be bringing We're a few waiting people. waiting for you with open arms. That's well, right. thank you so much. We're very excited to be putting this project together and we so look forward to coming um, in uh, late January. We're looking at January 30th to February 9th, but for our viewers and for you, just stay tuned. I'll send out the, uh, the formal flyer once everything is is confirmed. So, so, Paul, <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. I want to ask our viewers to turn into um, what the F is going on in Latin America every Wednesday. Uh, we're going to be broadcasting at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, which is 5.30 p.m. Pacific. This will be uh, Wednesday, November 18th, which is today going forward. And um, also to tune in to Code Pink Radio, WBAI, WPFW, which is uh, New York City and Washington, D.C., which uh, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific, every Thursday. So thanks again, Paul. Uh, look forward to seeing you early 2021 and hopefully having you back in conversation. I so appreciate yeah, your right. time. Okay. Take care. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We are now broadcasting every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 p.m. Pacific. This episode is part two of Hurricane Eta and climate change and governmental responses in both Nicaragua and Honduras. From Honduras, I'm speaking today with Gerardo Torres Zalea. Gerardo is the International Secretary of the Libre Party. Welcome, Gerardo, and I'm so pleased that you had time to join us today, especially given that um, Honduras is literally in between two major hurricanes, one last week and one arriving tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Terry, for the invitation. Hi to all the people in Code Pink and to all the people that are listening and hearing uh, and seeing this program. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and I hope that we can talk about what's going on in, in Central America, what happened with Hurricane Eta, and what's looking forward to happen with Iota. Well, why don't we start with last week's Hurricane Eta? That, that whole event, unfortunately, was buried by uh, the presidential elections in the United States, unfortunately, um, because it's such an episode related to climate change. And that is one of the things that those of us in the United States really have to focus on getting in front of the incoming administration. But let's talk about what, how the hurricane affected Honduras and how um, the people versus the government are responding. And from your position as a member of the Libre Party, what you would uh, propose be managed differently? 
Okay, well, first of all, we have to say that the reason why, why these hurricanes are called eta and yota and theta uh, is because there are so much hurricanes in this season that all the letters of the alphabet were covered. So according to the hurricane naming system, once you ended all the, the letters of the alphabet from A to Z, then you start with the Greek alphabet. So Eta and Yota, and, and if we have another hurricane, it will be called Kappa, are letters of the Greek uh, alphabet. So that's uh, starting there. It's like the, the first signal that things are not going well when you have more hurricanes than the letters of the alphabet. <laughs> And, so and the we've reason got more than 26. This, yeah, so you have yeah, to have so 20. many so many hurricanes that you there is not enough letters to name them. And the reason of that is is climate change. And 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 people that deny it or people that don't want to to look at it, there are like really strong examples of what's going on and changing in the planet. Uh, this this enormous quantity of, of wind and water is the production of the change in our in our climate in in the temperature of the planet and uh, we're in November the hurricanes don't last so long in the year hurricanes normally end in September or beginning of October it's really rare to see a hurricane in late October and, and we're now in, no, uh, in November the 16th and we're looking forward for one hurricane and probably two more so we may have hurricanes until december and that will be like the first time in history that we see something like that and so we're the having more hurricanes a, and a longer season both more and course. longer yeah yeah you have more and, and a longer season and mm -hmm. that is not a coincidence or that is not a miracle that is a direct consequence of climate change. So, so I think that the United States, that's one of the world's biggest industries and, and one of the biggest producers uh, of, of the things that affect our climate should start the conversation and be part of the conversation. Um, because Honduras, we don't produce uh, CO as the industrial countries do, but because of our position, because we're so face toward the Caribbean and because we're so poor and we have been uh, under the control of so many corrupt governments, we are one of the world's more, more vulnerable and fragile countries uh, facing climate change. So 10 years ago, we were already saying that Honduras and Haiti and some other countries that are not producers of CO, uh, CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, we are, on the other hand, one of the most fragile and vulnerable countries for, for climate change. We don't have evacuation plans. We don't have uh, alarm uh, systems. And we don't have them because of our, of our government. And we can talk about that a little bit more ahead. But to say about climate change is that the countries that they don't want to discuss climate change, like the United States, are not helping and are not stopping it. Uh, when you when you start seeing that ETA was able to cross all the Caribbean and hit the United States, you can see that we're talking about stronger hurricanes of these uh, superstorms that uh, some of people, I have read some things in the United States that people said that those are apocalyptic uh, literature, but you're now seeing superstorms, one after the other. And and they're affecting a lot of people and they're destroying a lot of cities. And this is not going to end until we face uh, the consequences that we are producing uh, to the planet. So climate change will continue and we will continue suffering its impacts and not being part of the conversation is not solving nothing. It's only making the problem worse and bigger and most dangerous. You know, one of the things we emphasize at Code Pink, because we're so strongly anti-U.S. intervention, anti-war, anti-military spending, is that the United States military is the largest carbon footprint on the planet. 
there's 800 that we know of US military bases on the planet. And it's the largest carbon footprint of, of everything else combined. And of course you are living in Honduras with the results of US interventionism, specifically the coup in June of 2009. Let's talk a little bit about um, the government that is basically sponsored by the United States and its, and its process of privatizing the economy and what responses that has allowed or prohibited and what, um, and what a Libre Party uh, perspective would be. Right now, most of the things I'm reading and seeing is people are pretty much on their own responding. They're responding at a community level um, and fundraising from all over. There's no, re no government resources and no go government coordinated response. Well, uh, first about the military forces, we have the headquarters of the CELCOM in Honduras. We have a military base called Palmerola, 80 kilometers from Tegucigalpa. That is the, uh, like the main office in the region of the South Command. That is the U.S. Army's office for Latin America and the Caribbean. We, it's a huge uh, base that uh, it's an example of that occupation that the United States has all around the world. Um, but it's not only a military presence, it's also a political presence because uh, the national party that is the ruling party of Honduras has lost two elections, 2013 and 2017. And now you see the United States and you see people that are beginning to be concerned or even afraid that they see, they see that President Trump is not willing to leave the office even though he lost the election. And they are asking questions like, what would happen if he doesn't want to leave? Well, you can see Honduras and see what happens when a president doesn't want to leave. And it's very hypocritical that many people that in the United States are pointing out to President Trump that he doesn't want to leave, supported the national party in Honduras when they didn't want to leave in 2013 and 2017. And we have to say that in 2013, the, the, the United States government was Democrat. In 2017, the United States government was Republican. So they have each one uh, done the same thing. They didn't want it that a socialist party as the Libre Party that had won the elections got to office. So they supported a government that without winning the elections stayed using the force and the military. So that's so this is the consequence of that. Uh, the National Party lost against us in 2013 and then lost against us in 2017. And they stayed because of the support of the United States Army and the United States Embassy in Tegucigalpa. What happens to a government that doesn't have any kind of support or doesn't respond to a political structure? Well, that government loses contact with the people. They live in a place where the people's opinion it's not important because they're not in office because of the people's support. They have to have good relationships with the United States government and with the United States military forces. If they have that, they'll stay in power. So that lack of connection of the government with the people can be shown and can be seen in moments like we saw in ETA. The government of Honduras knew that ETA was coming that because they had an agreement with the, some part of the private sector, especially the ones that control the hotels that have been closed for the last seven, eight months, they had decided to create this big holiday, a week uh, long vacation, so that people all around Honduras and in, in, in countries nearby could go to these hotels with biosecurity to uh, help tourism and help these private companies. So, we have been knowing about this holiday uh, in the first week of November since a couple of months ago. And we have been saying, it's ridiculous to open the hotels. It's ridiculous to give a holiday when we have a coronavirus pandemic that Honduras has over 100,000 confirmed cases and 3,000 dead people because of coronavirus. So we, that this means 
that we have a death rate of 3%, one of the highest in the region. And 100,000 people in a population of 9 million is a really high number of people uh, that are currently um, suffering of, of the consequences of the, of the COVID-19 crisis. So we, we were saying, don't do the holiday, don't open for vacations. It's, it's a really bad idea, but they continue because they don't hear the people. They don't, want, they don't care about the people. They don't hear the so, people and they support the private sector. Yeah, and, it, and, and it, it was a really bad coincidence for them and really bad luck because uh, the day that they were going to start the holiday, people were traveling from very, many parts of Honduras to the Atlantic coast to their vacations because people wanted to go to vacation they to put their mask and everything. The Florida Hurricane uh, Investigation Center warned the Honduran government that there was a hurricane coming. And on Monday of that week, they resisted to stop the vacation. And they mm -hmm. said, well, uh, the, maybe the hurricane stops in Nicaragua, maybe it uh, detours, maybe it gets really soft. Uh, don't forget to wear your mask and enjoy your vacations. On Tuesday, we had already the city of La Lima in the Sula Valley of Honduras completely flooded. And the, and the highways completely covered with waters and many bridges falling down. So we ha you had on Tuesday and Wednesday, not only the people that lived there, but the people that had traveled, uh, trapped in the Atlantic coast of Honduras. And then you had people that had escaped uh, of the high waters and, and the rivers to the roof of their houses that had to wait 48 to 72 hours to be rescued because the Honduran government had no response, no evacuation plans. And once the hurricane had passed, there were no actions to rescue people. So what people started to do was to hire small boats and the community started get, gathering money to pay for small boats and to go to rescue people. So the people that were rescued weren't rescued by the Honduran military forces, but they also weren't rescued by the United States military forces. Because if we have 3,000 Marines and, and Bravo troops and the U.S. Army deployed in Honduras, you should expect that if they assure that they are uh, a human saving service in, in our country, then they should have gone. We, we only have a video of a, of, a, of a helicopter of the United States base rescuing a family and then never coming back because they decided not to go and take out the people. And the Honduran military forces didn't go. So what's the point of having two military forces in your territory? I mean, the it's Honduran amazing to me United to hear States you say that. When you're, when you're facing a hurricane and you don't count with them to go and take you out of the roof of your house. It's amazing to be listening, hearing you say this, because presumably the United States is in Honduras to protect human rights. I mean, that's generally the purpose stated for U.S. deployment of troops, correct? That's what we hear, human rights. And absolutely no human rights ass uh, assistance in the case of this hurricane. None, what you're telling me. One, one, fan, one helicopter deployed. One, but, but then what... what what you heard in the news was that they couldn't do it because they were not coordinating with the Honduran uh, military forces. So one, one said that they, they didn't have enough helicopters and the other one said that they didn't have the permission. The thing is that none of them did nothing and the people that were rescued were rescued because of the community raising money of, the, of some private companies putting money to hire these boats. And we're talking about thousands of people that are, have now been declared disappeared that most likely died. Because you have the official count that is about 100 people dead by ETA, but they're not counting thousands of people that their family says, I don't know nothing more about them. They, they were on the roof of their houses, they lost the signal or the battery of the cell phone, we expect that they were rescued, but you don't know. You don't know if they probably weren't rescued. 
because there were, weren't enough votes. And the other thing, and this is the most incredible thing, is that when people got the boats, hired the boats, paid the, the gasoline for the boats, and were about to, 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 to save people, the Honduran police force that is mainly used to kill opposition leaders started stopping the boats and asking for the permission of the boats to save, pe to save people. And if you didn't have a permission that they gave to you, you weren't able to go and rescue people. So they were not only not helping, but they were trying to get money from the people that were trying to help. So uh, all of these together, and now you have hundreds of Honduran families living in the streets of San Pedro Sula, trying to look a place to sleep, and you only have really few shelters. And, and people are trying to go back to where they used to live and trying to rescue something and creating a, a big chaos. This just hours from the impact of another hurricane because of the same thing of the climate change. So we had ETA in less than 15 days from ETA, we're going to have IOTA that has now entered the Nicaraguan territory and that on the, uh, the night of this Monday and the tomorrow Tuesday will be striking Honduras and going through uh, the capital and the south of the country. So you still have people that have no shelter, people that are disappeared, people and families looking for their relatives, people that don't have food, and many people trying to find things, crowdfunding, putting what you have to take food to the people, because the government literally doesn't move a finger. And, and it's, it's a combination. It's a really sad and, and pathetic combination of people that first didn't want or care to do. And now, even if they want, they don't know where to start because they have no capacity to facing something like this. And uh, we had our, our first lady went going to some shelters and giving the little kids popcorn uh, and, 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 and plastic balls for them to play. And you're like, they lost everything. They lost their house. They don't have food. And you're giving them popcorn like, because that's what your head is able to think of in a crisis like this. So let me, I'm finding it hard to breathe. It's just so devastating. I mean, the, the circumstances you're describing are just, you know, really beyond words, quite frankly. Um, so as I'm listening to you talk, there's a couple things that come to mind. This series of hurricanes being the most and the strongest that we've seen so far. What does this, so I'm thinking one, given the lack of response by um, the Juan Orlando government, the U.S.-backed government, is Honduras considered, when we talk climate change, we sometimes use the term uh, sacrifice country, sacrifice country, sacrifice population. Um, so I'm thinking sacrifice country. I'm also, uh, you know, disaster capitalism and the opportunities for the private sector after the floodwaters recede. And, and then once the floodwaters recede, what sort, what sort of food production will remain. I mean, is, the crops have most certainly been flooded, I would imagine. It's like- What do we think like, about uh, this? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I've thrown it, a lot it, at you in one sentence. <laughs> no, uh, about, about uh, our situation as a really vulnerable and, and endangered country and population because of climate change. Uh, it seems like these authorities or these people that, that are in the head of the United States government and the governments uh, of, of the world don't seem to understand or are not willing to, is, is to make that connections between uh, natural phenomenons and their impacts and migration, for example. Uh, the temporary protection system, the TPS, that Hondurans have in the United States and have been fighting to keep started exactly because of the Hurricane Mitch in 1998. 
the country was destroyed. There was no capacity for pro food production. Their uh, houses were, neighborhoods were completely blown out of the map in the hurricane of 1998. And then we had in 1999, one of the huge or the biggest migrations to the United States. And then the government in, in that time, I think it was still Clinton's or the beginning of the Bush government, they decided to create this temporary protection system because of the huge amount of people from Honduras that were fleeing the country because there wasn't food here. So you have the caravans right now in Honduras. You have thousands of Hondurans that are going away up to, uh, from the country because of crime, because of violence, because of corruption, because of poverty. Add to this two hurricanes. What is going to happen next year? You're going to have hundreds of thousands of people of Honduras trying to enter the United States. So the consequences of the lack of actions, the consequences of this capitalism way of seeing the world in which you try to take over all the national resources without any regards on the consequences of destroying the river, of destroying the mountain, and not seeing, don't, not being able to see ahead of your nose or, or, or your wealth has consequences. And all the things that they have done in Central America and all the corruption and all the governments, the military and the violence that they have been sponsoring in Honduras has consequences and now the caravans. And now the, the lack of action from climate change would also have a, a really great consequences because of the impacts of ETA and YOTA. And we hope not another hurricane in the, in, but it's left at this 2020. So there's going to be consequences. There's going to be a huge migration to the United States. And that's what uh, the United States will have to face in 2021. It's not people that are trying to attack the United States. It's people that are escaping from a country, from a place that is really violent and, and it's really vulnerable. And it's really, it's really high risk to try to raise a family, especially if you're poor in Central America, specifically in, in Honduras. So, well, this is, this gives us our work as U.S. citizens at home, gives us our work to certainly, um, on a number of levels, um, to influence the incoming administration, to um, engage the world, re-engage the world regarding climate change. But also, this is, um, I mean, for me personally, Climate change is, is the number one root cause of migration and everything, and not to diminish all the other things you just mentioned as causing people to flee. But when you have a physically uninhabitable country, it's flooded. The floods have caused uh, crop production failure. How do you, there's no, there's no coordinated government response. There's no coordinated, we're not even talking about aid from the United States, even though there are military, there is a substantial military U.S. force in Honduras. These are all things that really we in the United States need to start taking responsibility for and, and to understand what U.S. economic and foreign policy is is doing particularly in physically vulnerable countries, I would argue principally throughout the global south, but also you know, in countries, low-lying countries, or in the case of Honduras, you have two coastlines, Atlantic and Pacific coast. So you're vulnerable from both directions regarding storms and rising sea level. So what, um, what can we do as US citizens? What, what would you, you know, on your best day, on your, on your primary wish list, what would you ask, what action can we take here in the United States? What would you like to see us do? Okay, uh, in order, not of political interest, but of human interest, you have to push toward your government to understand that the conditions of the people that you have in the Mexican border that are from Honduras are not criminals. They're asking for a, asylum because I'm sorry, everyone. It seems that we have lost um, our Wi-Fi connection with Gerardo in Tegucigalpa, and we hope that that is not a negative consequence of the impending hurricane. 
So before um, we sign off on today's episode, I just want to let all of you know that there's a couple uh, organizations through which you can make donations specifically to Honduras as they are, as the people of Honduras are getting absolutely no assistance, as Gerardo said, from their government. And you can make donations for the um, Honduran Solidarity Network at afgj.org and or through the Emergency Response Fund um, at SHARE, which is a capital, all capitals, S-H. A R E. I will post both links in the comments um, to this particular episode. And also I will include um, a couple links for donations to Nicaragua, specifically um, for the Caribbean coast. But, uh, and one last thing before we go, um, I want to thank our um, partners, co-sponsors for today's episode, Alliance for Global Justice, Chicago Alba Solidarity, Friends of the ATC, Friends of Latin America, and Task Force on the Americas. Again, please check the comments below for links to uh, donation sites. And we thank you so much for joining us today. We had a really compelling conversation uh, regarding this year's hurricane season and the climate change devastation it's bringing upon Central America. And I'd like to remind you that we broadcast this program, What the F is Going On in Latin America, every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. That's our new time, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 p.m. Pacific on Code Pink YouTube. And also don't forget to listen to Code Pink Radio every Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern and 8 a.m. Pacific on WBAI New York City, WPFW Washington, D.C. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.